You are listening to Jerry Royce Live Worldwide Podcast. Have you been hurt? Been hurt? Been back, back there? there? Got a talking back to you. Talking back. Cause you're not alone. No, no. Escaping to another reality. reality. Through Dominic Wilkins' good book. Good books, audio. Books, paperback, ebook, good books. Available on author D. Wilkins, goodbooks.com. Hi, this is K.S. Oliver, the author, the author of Fatline Almost Doesn't Count, coming to you from Jerry Royce Live Worldwide. You are listening to PositivePower21.org with Jerry Royce. What up? It's your boy, Kano Kingston. Hi, this is Angel Sessions. Hey, this is Kat. Hi, I'm Teresa Powell. Hi, Jerry. This is Iowa Sandro Carter. Hi, this is Paul Powers. Hello, this is Teresa Bobby with Jerry Royce Live. Hi, I'm Philip Byrne. I'm live on the Jerry Royce Show. Hi, what do you do? This is Boy Who's the Saint. Peace, this is Dolly, the poet, spoken word artist. Hello, this is Ramon Marquis with Jerry Royce Live. All right, all right, everyone. we got Robin in, and I'm keeping it live right now on Jerry Royce Live. Hey, what's going on, everybody? What's up? This is a war winning podcast with the greatest podcast on earth. Thank you for stopping by. I'm your host, Jerry Lewis Live Worldwide on Internet Radio, where you get your positive on. So when it's all positive, it's all power. That's positive power. This is a worldwide podcast for growth, wealth, and success. Thank you. Think you know how drugs get in those little brown bottles? Think again. Set in the green hills of western New Jersey, inside the gilded halls of power of a U.S. pharmaceutical company where decisions are worth billions of dollars and human lives worth less. Nicholas Harding, a young executive at Marshall Pharmaceutical, finds his career, family, and life in jeopardy. The Farmhouse, a suspense thriller novel by Bill Powers, published by Donna Inc. Publications, available at Amazon.com, or DonnaInc.org. Go to Bill's webpage at www.authorbillpowers.com. Are you looking for the next great read? A book filled with love, passion, betrayal, and intrigue. The award-winning novel, Season of Change, by Tamika Patrice Kane is sure to satisfy your literary sweet tooth. Check out this must-read book reviewers are calling uplifting and emotional and exceptionally great read, deeply intense and thought-provoking. Order your copy today, available in paperback and ebook on Amazon.com or at www.TamikaPatrice.com. Are you an author looking for promotional services or a reader looking for a great read at low prices? In this competitive world of books, Writing Royalty Promotions is dedicated to bringing authors and readers together to build a greater respect for literature through our various promotional services and online bookstores. So head over to writingroyaltypromotions.com and check us out. Thank you, everybody, for joining us, and welcome to PositivePower21.org. I am Jerry Royce Live, and you're listening to Episode 325 with K.S. Oliver. That's right, a.k.a. Ebony, and she's here to talk about her fictional book called Flatline, Almost Doesn't Count, available in paperback. That's right. We'll find out if it's available in Kindle when we get on, get her on here. Now, it also, um, oh, before we get her on here, let's, let's, I almost forgot about a sponsor. Let's get a word from my sponsor. All right? And, and this is my man right here, Deshae, James Deshae. Are you looking for a great book of poetry that is romantic, heartfelt, and full of male emotion? Then get Thoughts, Love, and Reflections by James K. Deshay. That's D-E-S-H-A-Y. Go to www.jamesdeshay.com. You will enjoy Thoughts, Love, and Reflections. Hi, 
Hi, I am Martha Crystal Alexis, and I'm on Positive Power 21 with Jerry Roy Slide. Woohoo! Yeah, you tell him, Crystal. All right, we're back with K.S. Oliver. She's an author, poet, public speaker, model, and business owner who was born in New York, raised in Georgia. At 30 years old, she is blazing a trail that many has been, have been inspired by. The oldest of 11 children, K.S. graduated from George Medical Institute with a diploma in medical billing and coding in 2005, as well as Colorado Technical College in 2011 with a degree in business while monitoring in criminal justice. Since then, she's been moving forward with building a unique and touching legacy. On t- May 20th, 2010, following the birth of her youngest son, K.S. K.S. was diagnosed with SLE, also known as lupus. Subsequently, she was also diagnosed with, with uh, disco, discoid lupus, a skin lupus, and a couple other things I can't pronounce. All right, we're going, we're going to get on here, and she's going to talk about everything, her book, um, some of the health issues she's been dealing with. Uh, we're going to talk about her book, how she's spreading the word, and inspiring people. All right, K.S. Oliver, how you doing tonight? I'm good, and you? I'm good. And welcome to Jerry Voice Live Worldwide. All right. Glad to have you on the show. Thank you for the invite. You're welcome. All right. And the first question, the first question for tonight's show is, who is K.S. Oliver, the author, poet, and public speaker? K.S. Oliver is Ebony Oliver. As you said, I was born in New York. I was raised in Georgia. Um, I've been in Atlanta since I was about 10. I am the oldest of 11 children. That is a fact. And I am a mommy of two. I'm an author, a poet, a lupus survivor, a lupus advocate, a model. I wear a lot of hats. My life is a constant whirlwind. Mm, yeah. Yeah, especially when I got to that second paragraph. I mean, you had a, you had many many more to go. I would need some oxygen to get through the other five. <laughs> but uh, we're here to talk about you. So, um, you know, you wear many hats. So uh, let's, let's start with the beginning. What, what was your what was your your um, childhood like? What was it like growing up as K.S. Oliver, aka Ebony? Ebony is the oldest child. So you know, a lot of the times when you're the oldest. You have the weight of the world on your shoulders. I got in trouble for everything everybody else did. You know, my mom expected greatness out of me, and between her and my dad and my grandparents, I was pushed to do such. They weren't taking any cut corners. You know, it just it wasn't going to happen. I had to make a grade. I had to stay on top of my game, and I had to set an amazing example for everybody else. And, I mean, I did all of that. I graduated from high school with 3.9. I graduated from college with 3.7, and then I got diagnosed with lupus right in the middle of that. And I failed my last semester of college, actually, because I got sick in between. Mm. So it was hard, and I didn't go back for a year to take one class. I was one class down, Mm. and it took me a year. Mm. Now... You know, we do hear. You know, you do hear. You know, uh, you know. I had a coworker who who um, who was you know trying to work through it. I mean, she had a very successful government career. You know, I think thirty something years, and then I think her last five years things went haywire with her health. Um, mm-hmm. Some days are good, some days are bad. Tell us a little bit about this about this 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 disease that you were diagnosed with while you was in college. You said college, right? While you were in college. Mm-hmm. Yes, I was in college right after I had my second child. I was already married, and I lived in England. So I was overseas living life. I was supposed to be having a good time at this particular point. I was 25 years old. I mean, I was having a good time. Mm. Um, In the interim, I mean, it it was crazy. It was like uh, one day I woke up after a trip to Vegas, which my husband sent me and my sister-in-law on, and I couldn't move my neck around too well. And I remember my mom, I was visiting in Atlanta, with the new baby. And my mom's like, oh, you know, you just slept wrong. I'm like, no, that ain't what this feel like. You know, this this feels a little bit a little bit more strenuous, just, you know, than just a crick in the neck. She's like, oh, Ree, and, you know, my middle name is Marie, so, you know, oh, Ree, you know, you're just overthinking it. Well, the next day my shoulders were hurting to the point where I couldn't pick the baby up. And then the next day it was my wrist. 
The next day, my hands were swollen. The following day, my back hurt so bad I couldn't sit up. It's like it started as one thing, and it just kept going. It was like a trickle effect. Every day, I was adding mm. to, you know, the list of pains I was having. And, you know, one one day I woke up, and I looked around, and I'm like, wait a minute. My hair is falling out. I had lost so much weight. Nobody even realized it. I would sleep through the days and still feel like I hadn't slept at all. And so I had just kind of told my husband, I'm mm. like, listen, I've been seeing these doctors here in Georgia for months. They had told me there was nothing wrong with me. They had made me think I was crazy. Everybody just had me thinking I had done completely lost my mind. Um, they had given me antidepressants. They had me on painkillers. Like, nobody believed that my body was actually going through something. They thought I was tripping. And the reason being is because lupus is very yeah. hard to diagnose. So unless you're looking for it, you're mm-hmm. looking at x-rays that say nothing. You're looking at blood work that looks almost clean. You know, you have to be looking for specific things in order to find out what exactly it is you're dealing with. Lupus is very hard to detect. So for six months, uh, so what is, everybody so what, thought I mean, that I was. You're going crazy. Right, yeah. Mm. So you were thinking <laughs> yeah, you were exactly. freaking your body just re- so, so your body was just reacting to what your mind was thinking. That's what they thinking. That and they charged it to me being postpartum because my son was only two or three months old when it all started. So, yeah, they, they kind of took that into yeah. effect and tried to tell me I had postpartum psychosis. Yeah, so, yeah, they called me crazy. I the same thing because, you know, yeah, because I was working with, um, you know, moms uh, for a nonprofit organization. I remember how some of the girls would go through, you know, they would have the blues, man, after the baby. You know, they just they just they couldn't even work, you know. I mean, they were messed up, you know. And, you know, some cases they they really needed some, some intervention, you know. So in your case, that's what they think you're going through postpartum. Um, right. So so they're drugging you now. At this point, they're drugging you, but you're having a lot of pain. So what you're doing, just I popping what? Just, pain. you know, you buying stuff off Every the street? Every six hours. You... No, <laughs> I should have. No, I was, um, no, they were giving me prescriptions for Vicodin, and I would take a Vicodin every six hours mm-hmm. and go back to sleep. I said, that was Every little, six hours, was like clockwork. Sleeping. Wow. Yep. So who was helping and you? And the funny thing is, is the Vicodin didn't take the pain away. It just took the edge off. Like, mm-hmm. it would be so bad that I couldn't move at all, and I could take a Vicodin, and I could at least sit up on the pillow. But I could still couldn't get up and move around like I should have been able to at 25 years old. Mm-hmm. So, so who helped, helped you with the baby at the time? My mom and my aunt, my stepdad, I have all my siblings. I came back home. I was around everybody. Oh, you had to come back home. My yeah. husband was in so Iraq. Did, so did your husband return back? Oh, he's in Iraq. He in actually was brought back. Yeah. Um, the military actually mm-hmm. called him back in the middle of his tour after I went back to the U.K. and passed out and flatlined in the hospital. They called him the next Ooh. day, and they brought him back in the middle of his tour. Mm, so you actually had flatline? I did. I did. So and I woke up there like, yeah, we almost so you lost fl- you. <laughs> I was like, oh. So you flatlined. This is, this is before you returned back home to Georgia, though. No, I went back to Georgia right after I had the baby before they sent my husband to Iraq. So I saw a doctor in Georgia okay. for six months. That's who kept telling me I was crazy. There was nothing wrong with me. So after six months of the foolishness, I told my husband, I said, listen, I can't do this. These people are not listening to me. Everybody thinks I'm crazy. You know, I got on Skype with him, and he's looking at me like, why do you look like you have lost every bit of weight? I was a size 3 about that point, and I had been like a size 10. Like, it, everything, I was like I was deteriorating one day at a time, and he was like, oh, no. So he booked me a ticket from Atlanta, me and the baby, back to England. My mama fought with me so bad about taking that baby overseas. She was like, girl, are you crazy? You can't stand up. You can't turn your head. But what she didn't understand was I was already tired at that point because I didn't know what was wrong with me. I was starting to think I was crazy. So I'm like, there's no way in the world I'm going and these people sticking me every day and they can't tell me anything. So I knew that if I didn't take one of my children with me, I wasn't going to make it because I was going to give up. I was tired. I was like, I'm not doing this. This has been going on for half a year, and nobody's been able to tell me anything. So I needed one of my kids in plain sight to keep me going. So I took the baby. Yeah, I understand that. 
All right. So you got there. So you, so when you, when you were in the UK, so you, you went back to the UK. So you seeing mm-hmm. their doctors over there? I went back what to the UK. Say? I got sick on the airplane. So they had to land the plane on the land strip and had the medics waiting for me on the ground because I had spiked the fever of 103 and I kept passing out on the plane. So I was getting worse by the minute. Mm-hmm. So I went back to the UK at a good time because once they took me off the plane, the doctor looked at me. He said, listen, and I had the paperwork from Atlanta, which clearly said that there was nothing wrong with me. He said, I'm not going to look at you and tell you there's nothing wrong with you because it's it's obvious that there's something here. I just don't know what the problem is. He said, but I tell you what, come see me every day until we figure it out. Fourteen days later, Mm -hmm. which was May 20th of 2010, I woke up that morning and I, I stood up off of my couch to get ready to go to this doctor. I had been driving myself to the doctor every day, as sick as I was. I was determined that they were going to figure out what the problem was. And one of the wives, um, that her husband worked with my husband, she came to the house to pick up the baby because I had a brand-new baby. And she's like, if you can't drive yourself to the hospital, I'm like, yeah, I can. And I stood up to grab my keys, and I fell back down because I was so weak. I was dehydrated. I had spiked Mm -hmm. another fever, and what I didn't know is my blood pressure had dropped to 85 over 50. Too, I think they told me. So I didn't have any energy. I just didn't know that I had gotten so bad. So I was like, yeah, I can do it. And I kept, every time I stood up, I kept kind of falling back on the couch. And she's like, no, you can't. So she said, come on. So she drove me. We walked in there and I passed out. I remember waking up mm-hmm. and hearing a lot of commotion. The doctor saying, you know, we've been trying to get this IV in. She's extremely dehydrated. Um, her breathing is low. Like I kind of just heard all of, you know, all of the, the little the little bits and pieces. And they ended up giving me a sedative yeah. and broke the fever. And then I remember they brought in a British doctor and a doctor from internal medicine. And he's like, we almost lost you. And I'm like, oh, okay. And he's like, no, really. And one of the other doctors was like, she wow. knows what you mean, because I was just kind of looking at him like, okay, well, you know, whatever. That's kind of how I felt at that point. I had been through too much yeah. at that time. It was just like, okay, great, yeah, I woke up, and now what? Yeah, I had a real nonchalant attitude mm-hmm. about everything at this point. It was just like, you know, great, I woke up again, and I'm still in this nightmare. Like, what are you going to tell me now? And that was my attitude. It was just like, whatever. Yeah. Yeah, you couldn't enjoy being a mom, you know, a newborn baby, because you was fighting no. for your life. All right, so so who figured it out? Who Who's the one that, you know, said, hey, this is what's up? Um, I had Dr. Hayes and Dr. Martin. Dr. Hayes had done all the blood work over the 14 days. He had brought in Dr. Martin to help him kind of dissect it some. And he came in there and he said, after he told me about the flatlining part, and I'm like, okay, now where's my baby? He's like, no, we need to talk to you. I said, no, where's my son? Because I didn't really know anybody. I hadn't been in the U.K. long. I got over there already seven months pregnant. I had the baby and came back to the United States. So, you know, any real mother is like, where's my kid? I didn't want to talk about anything until they could tell me where my son was because I know he was in my face when I passed out. So once they told me that, I'm like, okay. Mm. They ended up calling my husband. They're like, she won't listen. She's trying to go home. He's like, she's not going to stay there as long as there's nobody there to care for the baby. Ebony's not having it. She's going to go home. So they're like, okay, well, we got to figure this out because she can't leave this hospital like this. So he came in there. He said, listen to me. I believe that you have lupus, but I have to do another test. I said, okay, so now what? And he just kind of was like, well, you know, I could start you on the medication or I could not. He said, but if I don't, you may not make it until morning. And I just looked at him. I said, well, mm-hmm. that's a double-edged sword. I'm damned if I do, and I'm damned if I don't. So it seems to me like the easiest mm-hmm. thing to do would be to let you give me the medication, and either it's going to kill me or it's going to save my life. But if I don't take it, either that's mm-hmm. going to kill me or it's going to save my life. So it was really no, you know what I'm saying? It wasn't much decision for me to make. So I was like, well, go ahead. So they started me on, you know, all these medications and IVs. And I just remember I called my husband and I called my oldest son's father because I had left my oldest son in Atlanta. And I said, you know, they think I have lupus. These people don't know what's going on. And I was really calm about it because little did they know I was calm with at least having a slight inclination to what was going on, you know? I didn't really have an issue with it. I'm like, okay, now I at least have a half of an answer. And I just kind of told him, I said, well, listen, you know, I don't know what's going to happen. You know, I have two children, one by you and one by you. 
and I just need the both of you to make sure that they grow up together and they have a good relationship. The two of them get along, so I knew that wasn't going to be an issue, but that's just all I had to say. It was like my final word. Make sure my children grow up together. Make sure he takes care of his brother and make sure he takes care of his brother. And they both were like, you know, Ed, don't do this. And you're talking about my oldest son's father is, he, he played football for Morehouse. You can just imagine six feet tall, 280 solid. My husband, 200 pounds, mm. five feet eight. These two big people on mm. the phone with me about to break out in tears. Like, why are, you know, why are you even talking like this? What is up with you? And I remember my oldest son's father was kind of like, mm. you know, no disrespect, bro, but I've known her since we were 15 years old. Ev, don't do this. Like, what are you doing? I'm like, man, I'm tired. Listen, I'm going to see him. I'm going to let these people give me this medicine. But if something happens to me, neither one of them is trying to hear that. It was like, no, we're not going to have this conversation. I mm. said, yeah, but we are. Because I need to make sure y'all know exactly what I need for you to do. If something happens to me. And they kind of flipped out on me. It was yeah. like, you know, we love you. You know, your kids love you. I'm like, yeah, whatever. And I hung up on both of them. And I sat in the hospital by myself. Mm. I didn't really want to do too much talking. Um, I called my mom, and she cursed me out, literally. Because two years prior, well, three mm. years prior to that, my brother, my baby brother, he was 11 years old. He passed from leukemia. So, you know, to my mom, it was a, I'm not mm. burying another one of my kids. You're the oldest. You know better. You got to fight back. Yeah. I'm like, man, lady, I'm tired. Yeah, right. She's like, you don't get to be tired. And you're I'm not burying up. another kid. Yeah, I was done. I was done. Mm. I was like, I'm not doing this. These people mm. don't even know if I'm going to be alive tomorrow. Yeah, I was just like, uh, I just, I'm just not going to do this. I went months, you know, without knowing anything. And I fought through that. You talking yeah. about a Vicodin or two but really no medication in the middle of a full-fledged lupus flare. And anybody who knows anything about lupus, you're mm. talking about pain from head to toe, fevers, weight loss, no appetite. I wasn't eating anything. I was drinking, but I wasn't eating. So my body was just slowly mm. breaking down every day. Mm. So probably yeah, the doctor, I mean, he was like, don't know a lot about mm. it. Say so what? And that's, and that's the thing, I mean, a lot of people don't know you know, you hear about people having it, but it's like you don't really know what's going on, you know, with the body. It's like, I mean, what is the body really doing? I mean, because you're talking about pain, no appetite. What is really happening? Is it something happening to the blood? What happens what, is, is that your body, okay, so you know how you have your organs are supposed to protect you from things. So you have your liver, kidneys, all of that. My body finds all of those things to be foreign objects. It doesn't know what's good and it doesn't know what's bad. So when the lupus starts to flare, it causes oh, exactly. my body to attack itself. Oh, so in my case, um, right, it starts to shut down some of the major organs. So you have people, I know people who have lupus who have um, who are on dialysis because their kidneys is what is being attacked. Tony Braxton has heart, heart problems. In my case, fibrosis is my issue. I have lupus-induced pulmonary fibrosis. So that means when I have a lupus flare, my lungs are under attack. So it makes it harder for me to breathe. Uh, I get really short of breath. I can't exercise and, you know, just the typical stuff that normal, healthy people can do. I can't even walk far distances. Yeah. So if I go to the park with my children, mm. they already know. I, listen, it's going to take me 20 minutes to get to wherever you guys are going because I'm going to take my time because I know that I'll be out of breath if I don't. All right. So then the doctors now, this now, so this just can just happen out of the blue, anybody, just bam. Yeah. Yeah. No <laughs> so there's nothing, no warning, no nothing. I, it, ha- it happened that way for me. I know some people whose parents have had it. It's supposed to be hereditary. In my case, I really woke up one morning after a trip to Vegas. You know, I, I was living life. I was having a good time. I did have my son early, and they said that they, that may have been a contribution. I had him at 36 weeks. But he was nine pounds, eight ounces. There was nothing wrong with him. He came out, the fattest baby you ever seen, and I went on about my married day. You know, my legs hurt a lot when I was pregnant. But, of course, they charged all this to me carrying an almost 10-pound baby, and I wasn't even full, you know, at full capacity of the pregnancy. So now they're starting to say, okay, well, maybe this is a contribution. But that's it. Yeah, and you hear sometimes, you know, women develop certain type of medical problems after giving birth you hear cause like i said i was working in um that that industry healthcare industry with, with um young moms at risk moms matter of fact at risk 
Okay, we're going to take a quick break. We're talking to Ebony. We'll be right back and listen to her K.S. Oliver story. Her flat line almost doesn't count. And then hopefully, will we be able to get you to read some poetry when we get back? Is that possible? Sure. All right, so we can open up that when we come back. All right, let's hear from our sponsors. One moment, y'all. 60-second break. Are you an avid reader of urban fiction looking for drama, suspense, and more? We to a publishing is dedicated to bringing the world's best literature to our readers. Urban fiction, erotica, sci-fi, mainstream fiction, and children's literature are just some of the genres produced by our diversified family of authors. You can reach us on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and at our website, www.retwellpublishing.com. Hey everyone, this is Tanika Gonzalez, spoken word poet. Whenever I'm online, I'm always listening to Jerry Royce Live. You can find Jerry on www.speaker.com. Positive Power 21. All right, that's my artist. My artist, Tanika Gonzalez, just released Unplugged 2. That's right. It was a second one with Positive Power 21.org. Poetry from the heart, raw, real life experiences. And um, it's on CD Baby. It's free. Check it out. It's about at least 12 poems on there. Real mm, something else. You got to hear him. You got to hear him. I mean, she brings it. Brings it. And that's, that's like totally unrehearsed. All right. We're here talking to K.S. Oliver. In 2014, she released her first novel, Flatline, Almost Doesn't Count, which was inspired by her truth. That's right. Flatline was ceremoniously released on the fourth year anniversary of her diagnosis. She decided to take a leap and let the world read her rhymes of reason due to several people suggesting that she share her complete story after experiencing fragments of her memories via her poetry. Are you ready to read a couple of them for us, K.S.? Yes. Yeah. Um, this one is All called right, Lupus Has No Face. Um, Lupus Has No Face. Really, what does it look like, you or me? It's an invisible disease that no one can see. It's light and dark. In fact, it's young and old. It's a disease you wouldn't know we have if you weren't told. Imagine waking up and wiggling a finger or a toe, a pain test I do every day so I can determine how my day may go. The time you only live once is essential to us. Waking up in mild pain is always a plus. What would you do if you woke up in too much pain to simply sit up? Or if you needed help to simply pour juice into a cup? There are days when dressing for the day is the hardest task, needing help with no choice but to ask. One of us got diagnosed at the age of 25, told that she wouldn't live, yet she's still alive. Imagine walking and everything going numb, people not believing or understanding where it comes from. Can you picture going through life depending on a machine to keep you going as you watch your favorite TV show? Probably not. How can you relate if you really don't know? Sit back and think. If the temperature of a room could cause pain and discoloration of your fingers or toe, this is pain is harsh and lingers, not the kind your mom can blow. While you continue to brainstorm, we live this every day. The next time someone tells you you don't look like you have lupus, what does lupus look like is what I will say. Mm-hmm. That's powerful. I can feel that's real. That's real life right there. And that goes into what yeah, I was just telling you about with. the different organs. Like I just touched on, you know, mm-hmm. um, the kidney failure. Um, there's something called raynoids where when the temperature of the room changes, a friend of mine, her fingers turn blue. She can't be in too cold no. climate. She can't be in too warm climate. And ultimately, if she doesn't keep her fingers warm, they will have to be amputated. So that is, a, you know, something that she has to go through on a daily basis. Another friend of mine has no feeling from her knees down. Her feet, like all of that is completely numb. She is the only one of us that can wear six-inch heels 
all day long because she couldn't feel it if her feet started hurting anyway. These are like some of, you know, just the random things that people don't think about. Yeah. So you made friends with um, these people from the hospital? Is that how you met them? No. I met each one of them differently. Um, One of my friends, I met her before I got diagnosed. And I would be on Facebook while I was, you know, overseas at the hospital and stuff. And I'd be like, oh, I'm going through this. Oh, I'm going through that. And I remember the day I went into the hospital, she sent me an inbox message. She said, I've been following your post. She said, and I'm almost positive you have lupus because I do. I said, if these people didn't just walk out this room telling me the same thing. That was one of the girls. She, um, yeah. She's on dialysis. Another one I met in church, my, my baby, my youngest, was talking to her. And I kept shifting in the chair, and I started crying because I was in so much pain, but I was really trying to sit through the service. And she gave me a tissue, and she goes, are you okay? And I said, yeah. I said, I have lupus. I said, I'm in so much pain today, but I'm trying to get through service. She goes, me too. We exchanged numbers. We've been friends ever since. So I meet people at random moments. Well, now because I'm an author and, you know, I do so much public speaking, I meet more because I do, you know, the lupus clinics and the lupus groups and the lupus walks and, you know, just all of the things that we have. But then I was just walking into people. That's right. All right, we ready for another one. You ready for another, another one? Poem. Let me get y'all something yeah, else. Got ready. something else. This one I call brick house because I tend to be made of bricks, all depending upon which day you catch me on. I'm human, so I have my tears, but for the most part, I take it like a G, like I call it. I'm a pain in the butt. This is very true. Hey, me being real is all I know how to do. I've waited what seems like forever to wake up in minimum pain, to feel a bit of normality, a little more sane. The old folks say never forget where you come from, but I'll never forget where I've been. Lupus is so unpredictable, you could end up at that very spot again. I'm unlike others. I appreciate the smaller things that they seem to overlook. Waking up and not being able to get off the pillow, that was all it took. Barely able to even open my eyes, face throbbing from pain, not able to open my mouth without a cringe or a strain. I have an invisible disease you wouldn't know unless you were told. I'm built of bricks. Not even SLE can make me fold. Pills and shots may get me through a day, but I live life like a CEO, strictly my way. From a petite perfect size three to the new double-digit me. I'm a small on Monday, by Friday a large. That's just my physical appearance. My personality is in charge. Living my life requires faith and a large amount of guts. Trust in the Lord to cover me, no ifs, ands, or buts. I have a big mouth, and if you know me, you know this is true. Like you, I have a purpose, and it's to inform you. Mm. Oh, you're bringing it real. Real avenue. I'm trying to. That's real life. <laughs> I mm. try to. So tell us about this book, this fictional book, this Flatline. Tell us a little bit about Flatline. And thank you so much for reading your poetry. I really appreciate it. I love poetry. And like I said, I'm I actually um, working with an artist out of Florida, you know, bringing it real, you know, message to the world. Okay. And yeah, I'm gonna put some uh, music poetry on got me too, started so on that. Nice. I actually have an audio book to the one that I was just reading. Still standing was the first thing I ever released. Um, you know, when you go to see a therapist, if you've ever been to a shrink, which most people won't admit, I've been to a shrink. I've been seeing a shrink for years. I have no common sense. And I think that I'm certified crazy, and I think she's the only person that can deal with me. But she wanted me to write a diary, you know, kind of a day-by-day on the depression and, you know, being in pain and just coming to grips with my new life because that's what happened. When they walked in there and told me, okay, you have lupus, Ebony died. She died at that very moment because following that came a whole conversation about what I could and couldn't do from that moment on. Some days you're going to wake up and be able to hop out your bed and go on with your merry little life. Some days you're going to wake up and you're not going to be able to move. Oh, yeah, you got to take these 30 pills every day or you're going to die. That's a change from somebody who didn't even take a Tylenol. Yeah, that was a lot of change. Mm-hmm. So I was no longer myself anymore. I had to conform to the loopy. I had to conform to eating a bit more healthy. I had to conform to not overdoing it, knowing when to stop, when to listen to my body and when not to. There was a whole lot that came with that diagnosis in a matter of moments, which would bring me to why I titled the book Flatline. I titled the book Flatline for multiple reasons. I died that day, period. I mean, there's just not another way to put it, in more ways than one. 
you know, my heart stopped. My husband had to be pulled out of Iraq. Life as I knew it was over. There, there was a, a drastic change. She died that day. And then the new Ebony had to come about. And it's like, okay, now are you going to follow these directions and save your life? Or are you going to leave your children without a mother and your husband without a wife? Which way is it going to go? Yeah. And that was a decision I had to make. And it was a hard ways. one. Yeah. That's right. Believe you. Mm. Now I'm looking at your reviews on Amazon.com. That's where Ebony's book is available under her author name, K.S. Oliver. Paperback. Now, is this available in um, Kindle? It is. It is available on Kindle, okay. and it's available in paperback, and it's available on my website in paperback, which is where most of most people go to. Because, you know, people like sign copies of books. I write personal messages because I meet mm-hmm. so many people going through something that feel like they stuck, mm-hmm. and I've been there. Yeah. Yeah, that's right. Now, some of your reviews, you have some reviews out there. They're saying courageously brilliant, loved it. He said the author comes at you from a different angle with fresh perspective, creative approach. Really appreciate it. This is a wonderful book. If you're suffering from lupus or other chronic disease, this book is a wonderful way to look at it and a way to help you along the way. And they said, uh, Survivor, amazing story. People right, people right there with you. They feeling you. Yeah. Mm. So what you say to your your readers, your audience, your fan base? You know, you appreciate them people. I appreciate everybody, and I, I mean, I even appreciate the people who don't like me. I mean, you know, to me, it's it's a push, and that's just that's just in life. My life is too complicated to not be able to keep going. You know, I get inboxes from people. I get emails from people. There are people that are starstruck when they talk to me, like, oh, my goodness, you know, I read your book. And, you know, I like to talk to these people. I like to talk to people who go through the things that I go through. Sometimes I talk to people that are like, you know, you're so inspiring. And there are other times I talk to people like, um, what? I mean, what was your purpose in telling people that story? Well, I mean, either you like it or you don't. Mm. And it was to inspire oh, yeah. those people who can yeah. appreciate it, those people who go through what I go through. Those people who may not go through what I go through but know somebody else who does. I've had people buy my book for somebody else. That's right. So it just, mm. you know, I I appreciate everybody. I'm a very humble person. I've been through too much not to be. I appreciate the smallest things, like you have no idea. When I tell you the smallest things, I appreciate being able to get up out of this bed and walk down to my son's room to wake him up in the morning for school because once upon a time I couldn't do it. I appreciate being able to drive my car on my own. As my husband is over here mouthing, so why don't you wake the kids up for school? Because you do it. <laughs> but, you know, it's, it's, right. you know I appreciate yeah. being able to do those things. Mm-hmm. Now, are you, you signed under Kenny York? Kenny Enterprise? Nope. I am is self-published. That, she is my manager. Oh, That's what she is. That's why you spoke to her first. She, I mean, she's a really good friend of mine. Oh, okay. She, um, she does manage mm-hmm. my career because I am a mm-hmm. very busy Super. lady, so it's a lot easier. She's, oh, she's so lovable. I love her to pieces. Yeah, we are friends, so you know, we do, we hang out together, we talk, you know, all that good stuff. But um, I feel like in having a manager or marketing agent or anything it is that you choose to have, and I've had a few of them, it's always a lot easier. Mm-hmm. For me, it was it, it's better for her because she knows me personally. She's watched me go through a multitude of these things. She's had to come to the house and cook dinner for the kids when my husband was, you know, gone in the military. She's come to the house and sit with me all day long because I couldn't move. You know, she's kind of lived it with me over the past couple of years. So, see, when she's talking to other people about me, it's very easy for her to convey because she's seen it herself. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. yeah I've had, you know, managers else. and... Um, yeah. I've had marketing so you, agents so and managers that Atlanta have now. no clue. Yeah, I live in Atlanta. I lived in Atlanta. Yeah. Uh, I moved back to Atlanta in 2011 because I kept getting sick in the U.K. So ultimately they sent me back to the United States. I didn't finish the tour with my husband at all. Oh, oh wow. Okay. So he's back with you now. He's sitting right here. All right. Cool. All right. <laughs> K.S. Oliver, the poet. The author. Are right, you have another poem to read us to close us out for tonight's show? Sure, I'll read the one that started me in this literary game. 
I posted this yeah. um, poem yeah. on Facebook <laughs> a couple of years ago, back in 2012. And Marissa Palmer, um, also known as author Janae Robinson, she read it, and she inboxed me, and she said, I don't know you from point A to Z, but you just had me crying. And she said, I really think that you should publish mm-hmm. this. And I said, no, I can't do it. And she's like, yes, you can. I'm like, no, because then I have to tell people, you know, how my hair falls out and, you know, all these intimate details about having lupus, and I wasn't ready yet. Like, I wasn't to that point. And she's like, no, you can. We've been mm-hmm. friends ever since. And when I tell you, she inboxed me every day until I wrote this book. This poetry book came out because she <laughs> pushed me to finish it. This is called um, Who Do You Think You Are? And I wrote this sitting in the emergency room. Who do you think you are coming in trying to take over my life? Constant tests and countless times under the knife. I remember all of the days you tried to just take me. I have way too many people praying for my healing. Did you miss the memo? Can't you see? You messed with my white counts and caused me extreme amounts of pain. I'm a child of God. You can't claim my life, so what's the point? What do you have to gain? So when the pain didn't work, you decided to hit me where it hurt my self-esteem, taking away my pretty girl defense when my skin was clear and clean. Then a few months later, putting the shortness of breath to the test, a mask on my lungs shone with an X-ray of my chest. In a major flare for the next 122 days, trying to break my face in several ways. Another go-round with a constant nerve ache, so excruciating, the best, the best actress couldn't fake. One more try, you sent my body into shock. It came and went with no explanation, not even from the emergency room doc. So let me tell you, Satan, once more, stay under my feet where you need be, because I can promise you, you'll never have a victory. With me. That was the poem uh, that started wow. this. Yeah, it sounds like it. Hmm. Well, Ebony, I really appreciate you having have you on the show, sharing your life, you know, your you know, your pain, your struggles, you know, being real with us. You know, I'm sure somebody out there, you know, could be going through that same thing, either themselves or with a family member and probably have no idea, no clue, just like you. And maybe this you know, this can kind of shed life on what's going on. All right, we're gonna take a quick break and we come back. We're going to get K.S. Oliver's final thought on tonight's show. It's a.k.a. Ebony, fictional writer, flatline, almost doesn't count, available on Amazon, paperback, Kindle. Get it, support her, and pray for her. All right? Hold tight, they buy a commercial break with Bill Powell. Think you know how drugs get in those little brown bottles? Think again. Set in the green hills of western New Jersey inside the gilded halls of power of a U.S. pharmaceutical company where decisions are worth billions of dollars and human lives worth less. Nicholas Harding, a young executive at Marshall Pharmaceutical, finds his career, family, and life in jeopardy. The Farmhouse, a suspense thriller novel by Bill Powers, published by Donna Inc. Publications, available at Amazon.com or DonnaInc.org. Go to Bill's webpage at www.authorbillpowers.com. All right, we're talking to Ebony, a.k.a. K.S. Oliver. Man, she uh, she brought it tonight. And uh, you know, anybody listening to this show, you know, I know you probably got some questions, you know, what's going on with your health. You know, a lot of us got a little small aches and pains. But uh, K.S. Oliver can tell you a story, and she just told us one. All right, for that story... Kids, I want to play this song for you, okay? Because I, I think you're a champion. This is one of my favorite songs. I love listening to this in the morning. You know, I get up a little back pain here and there. Sometimes, you know, we got our little struggle, but it's nothing compared to what you're going through. But I want to play this for you, if you don't mind, for a few seconds of it, okay? Sure. All right, here we go. This champion by Epic Failure out of New Jersey. Rap, rap duo. <laughs> Diamond is a diamond. I've been waiting all my life just for this one night to show I can do it. So let's get to it. I got the heart of a champion. I got the heart of a champion. I got the heart of a champion. I a champion. And I will not give up. 
All right, that was for you. For you, Ebony, because you're a champion. I appreciate that. Yeah. You're welcome. You're welcome. I just had to... Now, give us your final thoughts for our audience. Listen to Broad. Somebody's going through the same thing and don't know what's going on. This could be a message to help save their life before they flatline and can't come back. Are you ready? Yes. Yeah. Right. I tell everybody, the smartest thing I ever did was went straight to the doctor when I felt the first pain. Because I probably saved my own life. And aside from that, just because you hit a bump in the road doesn't mean you have to stop. I live about as normal of a life as anybody else does. I just have to gauge what my days are. I have to do it a little bit slower, and I have to be very careful about it. But that doesn't mean that you can't go on to do whatever it is that you plan with your life and you can't achieve your goals just because you got smacked with a little bit of reality. Everybody goes through something. The something I go through is just a little different than the something you go through, and it doesn't make your something any less important than mine. Yeah, that's right. I, I, I've been hearing it on this show. I've been I've been on here over a little over a year. And there's been some struggles. People going through. But don't tell me about a headache though, because I'm gonna ask you, do you want to switch? Nah, I ain't about headaches. I'm talking about some people who are going through domestic abuse, you know, rape, violence, death, you name it. Some stuff. People going through some stuff. But yeah. We all got to band together and be here for one another. You know, the Jesus is coming. He's coming. You ain't lying. We're here. We got we to gotta be here for one another, you know. And people should be more vocal. Right, yeah, but you never know. Who's, go, who's been through something that you've been through. We can all help each other. That's right. That's the purpose of Positive Power 21.org. Bring the message to the people, you know. Whether, you know, we're in business, we got entrepreneurs out here all coming together for same common reason to share our talents, our pain, our sorrows, you name it. You know, we need to build each other up, not tear each other down. All right, Ebony, we got to get out of here, but we appreciate you coming on Positive Power 21 out, 21.org with Jerry Woods Live. Thank you so much for sharing your life with us. We appreciate it. Thank you. I appreciate right. you. You're welcome. And you tell Kenny York that we say hello. And I, I will. She probably all the time. You... <laughs> yeah, yeah. And I told Kenny and I told everybody, you want to hear the good stuff. I mean the real good stuff. You better listen to Jerry Royce Live worldwide on PositivePower21.org. And if you want to hear something on demand, go all the way back. I got 300. And what episode was this? 25. 325 episodes starring K.S. Oliver, a.k.a. Ebony. That's right, in Atlanta, Georgia. She was my 325th show, and I appreciate having her on here. God bless you. We will keep you in our prayers, and I hope everyone listening will do the same thing to, to hear you, because God, he performs miracles. And one day you could wake up and go a whole week long, and we hope that happens soon, that you, you won't feel no pain. All right? Thank Take care you. Of yourself. All right. Yeah. We'll meet again. Jerry Voice Bye. Live Worldwide. Thank you for tuning in to Jerry Voice Live on Positive Power 21.org and Spreaker.com forward slash Positive Power 21. This is a Voice Enterprises production. And don't forget about replay on Facebook.com forward slash Jerry Voice Live. Take care, everybody. Peace. Stay awesome all week long. Jerry Roos Live.